Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon. Welcome to Kong's Corner, the show where I become a Russian spy. Uh, this is actually a show where I read Harry Potter every single day because I haven't read it before. So please don't spoil anything in the chat or in the comments because that will ruin all of our joy and we don't want that. So please don't do it. Um, what? I, I, I just started off not knowing where my glasses were, not where, knowing where my, my, my pen is. So we had a, a couple of pretty intense scenes the last couple of reads. Uh, way too intense. Mad Eye's dead. Hedwig is dead. I hope somebody just doesn't die immediately this chapter too. Although it's called The Ghoul in Pajamas. So I don't think anything tragic is going to happen with The Ghoul in Pajamas. I swear. If... If something tragic happens in this chapter, with this chapter title, I'm going to stop reading. I'm never going to read again. This will be the last read ever. <laughs> How long does it take you to come up with these gags? Uh, I just think of it during the intro. What's something stupid I can say? <laughs> um, okay, Q song. Q song. Q song. Which song? Where are your pajamas, John? Now's the opportune time. <laughs> I should have I should have put on my tracksuit, my ramen tracksuit. Okay, so we're at chapter six, the ghoul in pajamas. I'm a ghoul in pajamas. I, oh, is it that this is that the song? I'm a ghoul in pajamas. I'm the ghoul in pajamas. I'm naked underneath. I'm a ghoul in pajamas. I'm a ghoul in pajamas. I'll I'll haunt you in your sleep. <laughs> Dex, come here, come here. Oh, he's just looking at me and acting weird. Okay, so let's get started, shall we? And Port Nobody's Mom is on, so we can get started right away. That's all I was waiting for. All right, the ghoul in pajam. The shock of losing Mad-Eye hung over the house in the days that followed. Harry kept expecting to see him stumping in through the back door like the other Order members, who passed in and out to relay news. Harry felt that nothing but action would assuage his feeling of guilt and grief that he ought to set out. Oh, there he is. Stay, stay, stay. There we are. There we are. Today he's got a different sweater on. Eh? 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 There he is. There's a little boy. He can rest on the bed. Um. Okay. Of guilt and grief and that he ought to set out on his mission to find and destroy Horcruxes as soon as possible. Well, you can't do anything about the Ron Mao, the word Horcrux. Till you're 17. You've still got the trace on you, and we can plan here as well as anywhere, can we? Or, he dropped his voice to a whisper, Do you reckon you already know where you know what's are? No, Harry admitted. I think Hermione's been, been doing a bit of research, said Ron. She said she was saving it for when you got here. They were sitting at the breakfast table. Mr. Weasley and Bill had just left for work. Mrs. Weasley had gone upstairs to wake Hermione and Ginny while Fleur had drifted off to take a bath. The trace will break on the 31st, said Harry. That means I only need to stay here four days. Then I can... Five days, Ron corrected him firmly. We've got to stay for the wedding. They'll kill us if we miss it. Harry understood they to mean Fleur and Mrs. Weasley. It's one extra day, said Ron, when Harry looked mutinous. Don't they realize how important... Of course they don't, said Ron. I haven't got a clue. And now you mention it. I wanted to talk to you about that. Is Dex in a better mood today? He is indeed. He got a very, very, very long walk today. Better not say that word. Did you notice? You look right at me. Can you see him in the back there? He's just staring me down. I don't know if you can see him. But there he is. Just giving me the old side eye. Here, have your, have your bull's penis. <laughs> this is a bull's penis. Yowza! Apparently lo dogs love it. Hey, friend, you're getting mega shoutouts recently? For what? <laughs> um, Ron glanced toward the door into the hall to check that Mrs. Weasley was not returning yet, then leaned in closer to Harry. Mom's been trying to get it out of Hermione and me. What we're off to. She'll try next to brace yourself. Dad and Lupin have both asked as well. But when we said Dumbledore told you not to tell anyone except us, they dropped it. Not Mum, though. She's determined. 
Ron's prediction came true within hours. Shortly before lunch, Mrs. Weasley detached Harry from the others by asking him to help identify a lone man's sock that she, sh that she thought might have come out of his rucksack. Once she had him cornered in the tiny sc scullery off the kitchen, she started the scullery. It's a scullery. Um, where is she at? Ron and... Turn off that cell phone! Ron and Hermione seem to think that the three of you are dropping out of Hogwarts. Hmm? She began in a light, casual tone. Oh, said Harry. Well, yeah, we are. The mangle turned off its own accord in a corner, wringing out what looked like one of Mrs. Weasley's vests. Mangle? Mangle? Scullery? What are all these things? Oh, it's a pantry. And what's a mangle? May I ask why you are abandoning your education? Said Mrs. Weasley. Well, Dumbledore left me stuff to do, mumbled Harry. Ron and Hermione know about it, and they want to come too. What sort of stuff? I'm sorry, I can't. Well, a Frankly, I think Arthur and I have a right to know, and I'm sure Mr. and Mrs. Granger would agree, said Mrs. Weasley. Harry had been afraid of the concerned parent attack. He forced himself to look directly into her eyes, noticing as he did so that they were precisely the same sh shade of brown as Ginny's. This did not help. Dumbledore didn't want anyone else to know, Mrs. Weasley. Uh, oh, sorry. Dumbledore didn't want anyone else to know, Mrs. Weasley. I'm sorry. Ron and Hermione don't have to come. It's their choice. I don't see that you have to go either, she snapped, dropping all pretense now. You're barely of age, any of you. It's utter nonsense. If Dumbledore needed work doing, he had the whole order at his command. Harry, you must have misunder misunderstood him. Probably he was telling you something he wanted done, and you took it to mean that he wanted you. I didn't misunderstand, said Harry flatly. It's got to be me. Uh, mangle is to clean clothes. It's what they used hundreds of years ago. See, these wizards in their clothes. It just doesn't make sense! <laughs> he handed her back the single sock he was supposed to be identifying, which was patterned with golden bu bulrushes. And that's not mine. I don't support Puddlemere United. Oh, of course not said Mrs. Weasley, with a sudden, rather unnerving return to her casual tone. Oh, I should have realised. Well, Harry, while we still got you here, you won't mind helping with the preparations for Bill and Fleur's wedding, will you? There's still so much to do. No, I... I, I of course not, said Harry, disconcerted by the sudden change of sub subject. Sweet of you, she replied, and she smiled as she left the scullery. I don't trust that. I don't trust that, Mrs. Weasley. Huh. From that moment on, Mrs. Weasley kept Harry, Ron, and Hermione so busy with preparations for the wedding that they hardly had time to think. The kindest explanation of this behavior would have been that Mrs. Weasley wanted to distract them all from the thoughts of Mad-Eye and the terrors of their recent journey. That would make sense. After two days of non-stop cutlery cleaning, of color-matching favors, ribbons, and flowers, of denoming the garden and helping Mrs. Weasley cook vast batches of canopies, however, Harry started to, to suspect her of a different motive. All the jobs she handed out seemed to keep him, Ron, and Hermione away from one another. He had not had a chance to speak to the two of them alone since the first night when he had told them about Voldemort torturing Ollivander. Ollivander. I think Mum th uh, think Mum thinks that if she can stop the three of you getting together and planning, she'll be able to delay you leaving, Ginny told Harry in an undertone as they laid the table for dinner on the third night of his stay. And then what does she think she and then what does she think's going to happen? Harry muttered. Someone else might kill off Voldemort while she's holding us here making volivants. <laughs> he had spoken without thinking and saw Ginny's face whiten. So it's true, she said. That's what you're trying to do. I... No, I was joking, said Harry evasively. They stared at each other, and there was something more than shock in Ginny's expression. Hang on a second. I don't get it. 
He's like, we can't be together anymore at the at the end of the last book. And they're basically just acting like they normally do, except they're not kissing. Is that what's happening? They're still bearing their souls and s saying, here's what's happening in my life. Or I don't, I don't understand their relationship right now. I don't, I don't understand it right now. Suddenly, Harry became aware that this was the first time that he had been alone with, with her. Okay, there we go. Since that stolen hours in secluded corners of the Hogwarts grounds. He was sure she was remembering them, too. Both of them jumped as the door opened, and Mr. Weasley, Kingsley, and Bill walked in. They were often joined by other Order members for dinner now, because the borough had replaced Number 12 Grimmauld Place as the headquarters. Mr. Weasley had explained that after the death of, D of Dumbledore, their secret keeper, each of the people to whom Dumbledore had confided Grimmauld Place's location, had become a secret, secret keeper in turn. Who's saying this? Who is saying this? No, uh, it doesn't say who's saying this. Who's saying this? Who is speaking? I, I don't know. Well, let's make it Ginny. It's Mr. Weasley. Okay, thank you very much, Barbara. And as there are around 20 of us, that greatly dilutes the power of the Fidelius charm. 20 times as many opportunities for the Death Eaters to get the secret out of somebody. We can't expect it to hold much longer. But surely Snape will have to told the Death Eaters the address by now, asked Harry. Well, Mad Eye set up a couple of curses against Snape in case he turns up there again. We hope they'll be strong enough both to keep him out and to bind his tongue if he tries to talk about the place. But we can't be sure. It would have been insane to keep using the place as headquarters now that its protection has become so shaky. The kitchen was so crowded that evening, it was difficult to maneuver knives and forks. Harry found himself crammed beside Ginny. The unsaid things that had just passed between them made him wish they had been separated by a few more people. He was trying so hard to avoid brushing her arm, he could barely cut his chicken. No news about Ma Mad Eye? Harry asked Bill. Nothing, replied Bill. They had not been able to hold a funeral for Moody because Bill and Lupin had failed to retrieve his, recover his body. Yeesh. It had been difficult to know where he might have fallen, given the darkness and the confusion of the battle. Uh, Bill. The Daily Prophet hasn't said a word about him dying, or about finding the body, Bill went on. But that doesn't mean much. It's keeping a lot quiet these days. Uh, oh wait. And they still haven't called a hearing about all the underage magic I used ex escaping the Death Eaters? Harry called across the table to Mr. Weasley, who shook his head. Because they know I had no choice, or because they don't want to tell the world Voldemort attacked me? The latter, I think. Scrimgeour doesn't want to admit that you-know-who is as powerful as he is, nor that Azkaban's been a, seen a mass breakout. Yeah, why tell the public the truth? said Harry, clenching his knife so tightly that the faint scars on the back of his right hand stood out, white against his skin. I must not tell lies. Isn't anyone, isn't anyone, of, the, isn't anyone of the ministry prepared to stand up, stand up to him? Asked, asked Ron angrily. Of course, Ron, but people are terrified, Mr. Weasley replied. Terrified that they will be next to disappear, their children the next to be attacked. There are nasty rumours going round. I, for one, don't believe the Muggle Studies professor at Hogwarts resigned. <laughs> she, hasn't she hasn't been seen for weeks now. Meanwhile, Scrimger remains shut up in his office all day. I just hope he's working on a plan. There was a pause in which Mr. Mrs. Weasley magicked the empty plates onto the side and served apple tart. We must decide how you will... Gosh, this, this accent. <laughs> uh, we must decide how you, you will be disguised, Harry, said Fleur, once everyone had pudding for the wedding. <laughs> she added, but he looked confused. Of course, none of our guests are Death Eaters, but we cannot guarantee that they will not let something slip after they have had champagne. Champagne! From this, Harry gathered that she still suspected Hagrid. 
Yes, good point, said Mrs. Weasley from the top of the table where she sat, spectacles perched on the end of her nose, scanning an immense list of jobs that she had scribbled on a very long piece of parchment. Now, Ron, have you cleaned out your room yet? Uh, Julia's birthday? Julia, happy birthday. May your day be blessed with many wondrous things that will happen in the day and night. Happy birthday. Um... Why? exclaimed Ron, slamming his spoon down and glaring at his mother. Why does my room have to be cleaned out? Harry and I are fine with, with it the way it is. We are holding your brother's wedding here in a few days' time, young man. And are they getting married in my bedroom? asked Ron furiously. No. So why in the name of Merle's saggy left? Don't talk to your mother. Don't talk to your mother like that. It's Merlin's saggy left. Oh, played with fire for a kid's book. <laughs> um, don't talk to your mother like that I said Mrs. Mr. Weasley firmly and do as you're told Ron scowled at both his parents then picked up his spoon and attacked the last few mouthfuls of his apple tart I can help some of it is my, some of it's my mess Harry told Ron but Mrs. Weasley cut across him. Uh, no, Harry, dear. I'd much rather you helped Arthur muck out the chickens. And Hermione, I'd be ever so grateful if you'd change the sheets for Monsieur and Madame de la Cour. You know they're arriving at eleven tomorrow morning. But as it turned out, there was very little to do for the chickens. Oh, there's no need to, uh, mention it to Molly, Mr. Weasley told Harry, blocking his access to the coop. But, uh, Ted Tonks sent me most of what was left of Sirius's bike, and, uh, I'm hiding, that's to say, keeping, it in here. Fantastic stuff. There's an exhaust gaskin, as I believe it's called, <laughs> the most magnificent battery, and it'll be a great opportunity to find out how brakes work. I'm going to try and pull it all back together again when Molly's not, I mean, when I've got time. When they return to the house, <laughs> I love him. <laughs> I love him. Uh, when they returned to the house, Mrs. Weasley was nowhere to be seen. So Harry sleep slipped upstairs to Ron's attic bedroom. I'm doing it. I'm do. Oh, it's you, said Ron in relief as Harry entered the room. Ron lay back down on the bed, which he had ev evidently just vacated. The room was just as messy as it had been all week. The only change was that Hermione was now sitting in the far corner her fluffy ginger cat Crookshanks at her feet, sorting books, some of which Harry recognized. Okay, so uh, Hermione is sorting books, but it sounds like the cat is sorting books. It says, we're now sitting in the far corner, her fluffy ginger cat Crookshanks at her feet, sorting books, some of which Harry recognized as his own in two enormous piles. Hi, Harry, she said as he sat down in his camp bed. And how did you manage to get away? Oh, Ron's mum forgot that she asked Ginny and, and me to change the she sheets yesterday, said Hermione. She threw numerology and grammatica onto one pile and the rise and fall of the dark arts onto the other. We were just talking about Mad-Eye, Ron told Harry. I reckon he must have survived. But he, I reckon he might have survived. What? But Bill saw him hit... By the killing curse, said Harry. Yeah, but Bill was under attack too, said Ron. How can we be sure what he saw? Even if the killing curse missed, Mad-Eye still fell about, about a thousand feet, said Hermione, now weighing Quidditch teams of Britain and Ireland in her hand. He could, um, he could have used a shield charm. Fleur said his wand was blasted out of his hand, said Harry. Well, all right, if you want him to be dead said Ron grumpily, punching his pillow into more comfortable shape. Of course we don't want him to be dead, said Hermione, looking shocked. It's dreadful that he's dead, but we're being realistic. For the first time, Harry imagined Mad-Eye's body, broken as Dumbledore's had been. Oh, 
Oh. I didn't... Oh, no. I, did, I didn't envision Dumbledore's body to be so broken. I just imagined him, you know, peacefully lying there. And now I got that image in my head. Dumbledore's broken body. No. No. Yet, with that one eye still whizzing in its socket, he felt a stab of revulsion mixed with a bizarre desire to laugh. The Death Eaters probably tidied him up, tidied it, tidied up after themselves. That's why no one's found him," said Ron wisely. "Yeah," said Harry, "like Barty Crouch turned into a bone and buried in Hagrid's front garden. They probably transfigured Moody and stuffed him." "Don't!" squealed Hermione. "That's so dark, Harry." Don't, squealed Hermione, startled. Harry looked over just in time to see her burst into tears over her copy of Spellman's syllabary. Oh, uh, no, said Harry, struggling to get up from the old camp bed. Hermione, I, I wasn't trying to upset, but with a great creaking of rusty bed springs, Ron bounded off the bed and got there first. <laughs> ah. One arm around Hermione, he fished in his jeans pocket and withdrew, withdrew a revolting-looking handkerchief <laughs> that he had used to clean the oven earlier. Hastily pulling out his wand, he pointed at the rag and said, Tergeo! Tergeo, whatever that is. Um, the wand siphoned off most of the grease, looking rather pleased with himself. Anyway, this music doesn't really fit right now. Ron handed the slightly smoking handkerchief to Hermione. Oh, thanks, Ron. Oh, I'm sorry. She blew her nose and hiccup. <laughs> it's just so awful, isn't it? Right after Dumbledore, I, I just never imagined Mad Eye dying somehow, and he seems so tough. Yeah, I know, said Ron, giving her a squeeze. But you know what he'd say to us if he were here. Constant vigilance, said Hermione, mopping her eyes. That's right, said Ron, nodding. He'd tell us to learn from what happened to him. And what I've learned is not to trust that cowardly little squid Mundungus. Hermione gave a shaky laugh and leaned forwards to pick up two more books. Applause, Ron. Applause, Ron. Good job. This is the best job he's done with Hermione in the entire seven books. I think. Uh, that track is my favorite. They still are maybe teenager, but for sure not adult books. They're not adult books. Yeah, they're not kids books. They're like teenage books. Why A? Why A books? Then I'm really thanks, Jerry. Make me forget all the bad things for minutes or an hour. Oh, thank you, Miguel. I'm glad. Hermione gave a shaky laugh and leaped forwards to pick up two more books. A second later, Ron had snatched his arm back from around her shoulders. She had dropped the, mon the monster book of monsters on his foot. The, bo the book had broken free from its restraining belt and snapped viciously at Ron's ankle. <laughs> the book. I'm, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Hermione cried as Harry wrenched the book from Ron's leg and retied re it shut. What are you doing with all these books anyway? Ron asked, limping back to his bed. Just trying to decide which ones to take with us, said Hermione, when we're looking for the Horcruxes. Oh, Horse, Ron said, clapping a hand to his forehead. I forgot we'll be hunting down Voldemort in a mobile library. Ha ha, said Hermione, looking down at Spellman's syllabary. Hmm. I wonder, will we, will we need to translate runes? It's possible. I think we'd better take it to be safe. <laughs> you know what? You know what? I bet... I, I, I'm calling the premonition. I'm an idiot, idiot. It's time for John's premonition. First of all, Hermione, Sharon said Hermione needs a Kindle. True. True, she does. Um, there is going to be a time where she needs to translate runes. It's going to happen. For sure. It's go it's, it is going to happen in this book. I'm calling it. I'm going to go to some ancient place. There's going to be some kind of runes. Just give me like, I, I know how to open up this door now. 
She dropped the syllabary onto the larger of the two piles and picked up Hogwarts a history. Listen, said Harry. He sat up straight. Ron and Hermione looked at him with sim similar mixtures of re resignation and defiance. I know you, s you said, after Dumbledore's funeral, that you wanted to come with me. Harry began. Here he goes, Ron said to Hermione, rolling his eyes. As we know he would, she sighed, turning back to the books. You know, I think I will take Hogwarts a history. Even if I'm not going back there, I don't think I'd feel right if I don't have it with... Listen, said Harry again. No, Harry, you listen, said Hermione. We're coming with you. That was decided months ago. Years, really. But shut up, Ron advised him. <laughs> Are you sure you thought this through? Harry persisted. Let's see, said Hermione, slamming travels with trolls onto the discarded pile with a rather fierce look. I've been packing for days, so we're ready to leave at a moment's notice, which from your information has included doing some pretty difficult magic, not to mention smuggling Mad Eye's whole stock of polyjuice potion right under Ron's mum's nose. I've also modified my parents' memories so that they're convinced they're really called Wendell and Monica Wilkins, and that their life's ambition is to move to Australia, which they, na they now have done. That's to make it more difficult for Voldemort to track them down and interrogate them about me. Or you, because unfortunately, I told them quite a bit about you. Assuming I survive our hunt for the Horcruxes, I'll find Mum and Dad and lift the enchantment. If I don't, well, I think I've cast a good, good enough charm to keep them safe and happy. Wendell and Monica Wilkins don't know that they've got a daughter. You see? Hermione's eyes were swimming with tears again. Wow. This is crazy. They, she's changed her whole parents' perception of the universe. Of the world. <sighs> That's, I mean, it's funny, but it's also pretty crazy for, her, for Hermione. Ron got back off the bed, put his arm around her once more. Good friend. Good friend. But he's making moves. And frowned at, or is he? I don't know. I don't know. That'd be a bit skeezy if he's trying to use these opportunities. Maybe just he just genuinely cares. Of course. He's, he's a good friend. Of course. And, and frowned at Harry as though reproaching him for lack of tact. Harry could not think of anything to say, not least because it was highly unusual for Ron to be teaching anyone else tact. I... Hermione, I... I'm sorry. I didn't... Didn't realize that Ron and I know perfectly well what might happen if we, if we come with you. What well, we do. Ron, show Harry what you've done. Ah, oh, he's just eaten, said Ron. Go on, he needs to know. All right. R Harry, come here. For the second time, Ron withdrew his arm from around Hermione and stumped over to the door. Come on. Why? Harry asked, following Ron out of the room onto the tiny lando landing. The sendo muttered Ron, pointing his wand at the low ceiling. A hatch opened right over their heads, and a ladder slid down their feet. A horrible, half-sucking, half-moaning sound came out of the square hole, along with an unpleasant smell like open drains. We got the pajama ghoul. That's your ghoul, isn't it? asked Harry, who had never actually met the creature that sometimes disrupted the, the nightly silence. Yeah. It is. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now I remember this ghoul. He's always like, I'm in the walls. Kill me. <laughs> End this torment. Yeah, it is, said Ron, climbing the ladder. Come and have a look at him. Harry followed Ron up the few short steps into the tiny attic space. His head and shoulders were in the room before he caught sight of the creature curled up a few feet from him. A little creepy music. Why not? fast asleep in the gloom with his large mouth wide open. But it it looks... Do ghouls normally wear pajamas? No, said Ron. Nor have they usually got red hair or that number of pustules. Harry contemplated the thing, slightly revolted. It was human in shape and size, and... Oh, um, if the ghoul has adjectives, uh, or much to say, please give me some adjectives for this specific ju uh, ghoul, not jewels. Adjectives for the ghoul. Harry contemplated the thing, slightly revolted. It was human in shape and size and was wearing now... Oh, what? 
now Harry's eyes became used to the darkness, was clearly an old pair of Ron's pajamas. He was also sure that ghouls were generally rather slimy and bald, rather than distinctly hairy and covered in angry purple blisters. He's me, see? said Ron. No, said Harry, I don't. I'll explain it back in my room. The smell's getting to me. Okay, well, it wasn't that creepy. Then Ron. They climbed back down the... He's me? They climbed back down the ladder, which Ron returned to the ceiling and rejoined Hermione, who was still sorting books. Once we've left, the ghoul's going to come and live down here in my room, said Ron. I think he's really looking forward to it. Well, it's hard to tell, because all he can do is moan and drool. But he nods a lot when you mention it. Anyway, he's going to be me with Spattergroid. Good, eh? <laughs> what? <laughs> Harry merely looked his... Harry merely looked his confusion. What is that sentence? Harry merely looked his confusion. Typo. It seems like a typo to me. It is said Ron, clearly frustrated that Harry had not grasped the brilliance of his plan. Look, when we're three, don't... When when we three don't turn up at Hogwarts again, everyone's going to think Hermione and I must be with you, right? Which means the Death Eaters will go straight for our families to see if we've got... if they've got information on where you are. But hopefully, it looked like I've gone away with Mum and Dad. A lot of Muggleborns are talking about going into hiding at the moment. Oh no, but hopefully, it looked like I've gone away with Mum and Dad. A lot of Muggleborns are talking about going into hiding at the moment, said Hermione. We can't hide my whole family. They look too fishy and they can't all leave their jobs, said Ron. So we're going to put out the story that I'm seriously ill with Spattergroid, which is why I can't go back to school. If anyone comes calling to investigate, Mum or Dad can show them the ghoul in my bed, covered in postules. Spattergroid's really contagious, so they're not going to want to go near him. It won't matter that he can't say anything either, because apparently... You can't once use the fungus. You can't once you, uh, but because apparently you can't once the fungus has spread to your to your uvula 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 uvula. And your mum and dad are in on this plan," said Harry. Asked Harry, "Dad is he helped Fred and George transform the ghoul?" Mum, well, you've seen what she's like. She won't accept we're going till we've gone. Well, that's actually a pretty good plan. Pretty good. Pretty good plan. Yeah. Is that Dex's eyes glowing? Oh no, that's just like a little metal piece from the zipper. Uh, ghouls and pajamas are covered in sores. The dangling from the back of your throat, right? Uvula, uvula. There was silence in the room, broken only by gentle thuds as Hermione continued to throw books onto one pile or the other. Ron sat watching her, and Harry looked from one to the other, unable to say anything. The measures they had taken to protect their families made him realize, more than anything else could have done, that they really were going to come with him, and that they knew exactly how dangerous that would be. He wanted to tell them what that meant to him, but he simply could not find words important enough. Through the silence came the muffled sounds of Mrs. Weasley shouting from four floors below. Ginny's probably la- Oh, no, oh, uh, no, so, no, that's wrong. Ginny's probably left a speck of dust on a poxy napkin ring, said Ron. I don't know why the Delacours have got to come two days before the wedding. Um, who's saying this? Fleur's sister, Fleur's sister's a bridesmaid. She needs to be here for the rehearsal, and she's too young to come on her own, said Hermione, as she poured indecisively over break with a banshee. Well, guess I'm going to help Mum's stress levels, said Ron. What we really need to decide, said Hermione, tossing defensive magical theory into the bin without a second glance and picking up an appraisal of magical education in Europe, hmm. is where we're going after we leave here. I know you said you wanted to go to Godric's Hollow first, Harry, and I understand why, but, well, shouldn't we make the Horcruxes our priority? Priori priority? If we knew where any of the Horcruxes were, I'd agree with you, said Harry who did not believe that Hermione really understood his desire to return to Godric's Hollow. Can somebody please remind me what God, uh, why, what, what's in Godric's Hollow and why he wanted to go there? I completely forget. Again. It's just so much information all the time. And usually, you know, you can go back and look at things, but I'm in the middle of something here. 
Birthplace of Harry. Okay, Harry was born there. Okay, thank you. Where were we? Oh, yeah. His parents' graves were only part of the attraction. He had a strong, though inexplicable, feeling that the place held answers for him. Perhaps it was simply because it was there that he had survived Voldemort's killing curse. Now that he was facing the challenge of repeating the feat, Harry was drawn to the place where it had where it had happened, wanting to understand. Don't you think there's a possibility that Voldemort's keeping a watch on Godric's Hollow? Hermione asked. He might expect you to go back and visit your parents' graves once you're free to go wherever you like. This had not occurred to Harry. While he struggled to find a counter-argument, Ron spoke up, evidently following his own train of thought. Ah! Uh, this is... Ah! Uh, ah! Uh, this is one thing I don't like. This is, this is a general thing. So when he makes a good point, does it not occur to Harry? While well, he struggled to find a counter-argument. I don't like when somebody is just... I'm like, this is my point of view, and I'm going to find arguments. Versus... It's like, this is a good point. Respond to the point. And if, and if you're wrong, you're wrong. Don't just argue something for the sake of arguing and being right. Argue for the sake of finding truth. This had not occurred to Harry. While he struggled to find a counter-argument, Ron spoke up, evidently following his own train of thought. This R.A.B. person, he said, you know, the one who stole the real locket. Hermione, Hermione nodded. He said in his note he was going to destroy it, didn't he? Harry dragged his rucksack towards him and pulled out the fake horcrux in which R.A.B.'s note was still fodded. That's pretty good for a Gryffindor, John. <laughs> thanks, thanks. Danny Jord, well, that's how debates work, but I agree. But it's not a debate, it's an argument you're having with somebody. Debates are very different. Um, okay, let's get going. He pulled out the RB note, which was still folded. I have stolen the real Horcrux and intend to destroy it as soon as I can. Harry read out. Oh, yeah, this RAB person. Who is this RAB person? Uh, who would, could that be? Some minor character? I can't think because so many important characters are current there. So who is who is missing? Who is missing? Who could this R A B character be? Um. Okay, he fell from the tower. I'm, I I can't figure it out. I don't I don't know who is missing. Like maybe it's an earlier character from the books. R A B. I can't. I don't know. I have no idea. Ah. <sighs> okay. Where are we? Well, what if he did finish it off? Said Ron. Or oh, she interposed Hermione. Whichever, said Ron. It'd be one less for us to do. Yes, but we're still going to have to try and trace the real lockets, aren't we? Said Hermione. To find out whether or not it's destroyed. And once we get a hold of it, how do you destroy a Horcrux? Asked Ron. Well, said Hermione, I've been researching that. How? Asked Harry. I didn't think there were any books nor Horcruxes in the library. There weren't, said Hermione, who had turned pink. Dumbledore removed them all, but he... He didn't destroy them. Ron sat up straight wide-eyed. How in the name of Merlin's pants have you managed to get your hands on those Horcrux books? It it wasn't stealing, said Hermione, looking from Harry to Ron with a kind of desperation. There were still library books, even if Dumbledore had taken them off the shelves. Anyway, if you really didn't want anyone to get at them, I'm sure he would have made it much harder to get to the point, said Ron. Well, it was easy, said Hermione in a small voice. I just did a summoning charm, you know, Accio, and they zoomed out of Dumbledore's study with that window right into the girls' dormitory. But when did you do this? Harry asked, regarding Hermione with a mixture of admiration and incredulity. Just after his Dumbledore's funeral, 
said Hermione in, in an even smaller voice. Right after we'd agreed we'd leave school and go and look for the Horcruxes. When I went back upstairs to get my things, it, it just occurred to me that the more we knew about them, the better it would be. And I was alone in there, so I tried. And it worked. They flew straight in through the open window and I, I attacked them. She swallowed and then said imploringly, I can't believe Dumbledore would have been angry. It's not as though we're going to use the information to make a Horcrux, is it? Can you hear us complaining? Said Ron. Where are these books anyway? Hermione rummaged for a moment and then extracted from the pile a large volume, bound in faded black leather. She looked a little nauseated and held it as gingerly as if it were something recently dead. She just cannot handle breaking rules. I mean, when it has to do with, some, with doing something for someone and out of love, she breaks rules. But this is just like, oh, stealing books from the library. Can you see by the message mark link? Please keep your R.I.B. joke spoilers off the chat. Thanks. See, yeah, that'd be good. All right, we got some some spoiler stuff going. Maybe, maybe not. Who cares? Just trust the mods. Trust the mods, please. All right. Uh, this is the one that gives explicit instructions on how to make a Horcrux. Secrets of the Darkest Art. It's a horrible book. Really awful. Full of evil magic. I wonder when Dumbledore removed it from the library. If he didn't do it until he was headmaster, I bet Voldemort got all, got all the instructions he needed from here. Why did he have to ask Slughorn how to make a Horcrux then if he'd already read that? Asked Ron. He only approached Slughorn to find out what... Oh, no. He only approached Slughorn to find out what would happen if you split your soul into seven, said Harry. Dumbledore was sure Riddle already knew how to make a Horcrux by the time he asked Slughorn about them. I think you're right, Hermione. That could easily have been where he got the information. And the more I've read about them, said Hermione, the more horrible they seem, and the less I can believe that he actually made six. It warns in this book how unstable you make the rest of your soul by ripping it, and that's just by, by making one Horcrux. Harry remembered what Dumbledore had said about Voldemort moving beyond usual evil. Isn't there any way of putting yourself back together? Ron asked. Yes, said Hermione with a hollow smile. But it would be excruciatingly painful. Why? How do you do it? asked Harry. Remorse, said Hermione. You've got to really feel what you've done. There's a footnote. Apparently the pain of it can destroy you. I can't see Voldemort attempting it somehow, can you? No, said Ron, before Harry could answer. So, does it say how to destroy Horcruxes in that book? I have the permission, but I'm going to wait until the end of all this information. Yes, said Hermione. Now turning the... Oh, and by the way, if you're... If you're getting pissed about the mods, what they're moderating or not, there's no need. They're just following uh, what I asked them to moderate, right? Uh, you know, get pissed at me for it. Because honestly, that that's what I said, is anything that has to do with anything hinting at the future or anything that has to do with something that, we, that hasn't been revealed yet or making jokes or saying, I'm excited for this, that's what they're moderating. It's, it's based on what I have instructed them to do. So getting angry at them, there's no really any point to that. You can get angry at me. Uh, yes, said Hermione, now turning the fragile pages as if examining rotting entrails. Because it warns dark wizards how strong they have to make the enchantments on them. From all that I've read, what Harry did to Riddle's diary was one of the few really foolproof ways of destroying a Horcrux. What? Stabbing it with a bas basilisk fang? Asked Harry. Oh, well, lucky we've got such a large supply of basilisk fangs then, said Ron. I was wondering what we we're going to do with them. <laughs> love his humor. Love it. It doesn't have to be a basil basilisk fang, said Hermione patiently. It has to be something so destructive that the Horcrux can't repair itself. Basilisk venom only has one antidote, and it's incredibly rare. Phoenix tears, said Harry, nodding. Exactly, said Hermione. 
Our problem is that there are very few substances as destructive as basilisk, basilisk venom, and they're all dangerous to carry around with you. That's a problem we're going to have to solve, though, because ripping, smashing, or crushing a Horcrux won't do the trick. You've got to put it beyond magical repair. But even if we wreck the things it lives in, said Ron, why can't the bit of soul in it just go and live in something else? Because a Horcrux is the complete opposite of a, comp of a human being. Seeing that Harry and Ron looked thoroughly confused, Hermione hurried on. I like this. They're getting details about what a Horcrux is. Um, look, if I picked up a sword right now, Ron, and ran you through with it, I wouldn't damage your soul at all. Which would be a real comfort for me, I'm sure, said Ron. Harry laughed. It should be, actually. But my point is that whatever happens to your whatever happens to your body, your soul will survive untouched, said Hermione. But it's the other way round with a Horcrux. The fragments of soul it, inside it depends on its container, its enchanted body for survival. It can't resist. It it, it can't exist without it. Uh, okay, whatever happens to your body, your soul will survive untouched. Okay, but it's the other way around with a Horcrux. The fragment of soul inside it depends on its container. It's enchanted body for survival. It can't exist without it. Okay. That diary sort of died when I stabbed it, said Harry, remembering ink pouring like blood from the punctured pages. Man, she was thinking about these things way back in those books. And the screams of the piece of Voldemort's soul as it vanished. And once the diary was... And, and, uh... And once the diary was pro probably destroyed, the bit of soul trapped in it could no longer exist. Ginny tried to get rid of the diary before you did, flushing it away, but obviously it came back good as new. Hang on, said Ron, frowning. The bit of soul in that diary was possessing Ginny, wasn't it? How does that work, then? While the, magi while the magical container is still intact, the bit of soul inside it can f flit in and out of someone if they get too close to the object. Oh, wow. I don't mean holding holding it for too long. It's nothing to do with touching it, she added, before Ron could speak. I mean close, emotionally. Ginny poured her heart out into that diary. She made herself incredibly vulnerable. You're in trouble if you get too fond or dependent on the Horcrux. I wonder how Dumbledore destroyed the ring, said Harry. I have to ask him. I never really... His voice trailed, tailed away. He was thinking of all the things he should have asked Dumbledore, and of how, since the headmaster had died, it seemed to Harry that he had wasted so many opportunities when Dumbledore had been alive to find out more, to find out everything. It's crazy how well thought out it all was, all the way back from the first books. Yeah, it's, it is actually pretty crazy. Okay, so you have to be emotionally connected to the the objects for it to possess you in a way. The silence was shattered as the bedroom door flew open with a wall shaking crash. Hermione shrieked and dropped secrets of the darkest art. Crookshank streaked under the bed, hissing indignantly. Ron jumped off the bed, skidded on a discarded chocolate frog wrapper, and smacked his head on the opposite wall. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> the biggest piece of slapstick in the series. It's like sitting on a bed, whoa, whoa, skidding across on a wrapper and smacking into the wall. Get out of here, Rowling. Get out of here. <laughs> Get out of here. Um, and Harry instinctively dived for his wand before realizing that he was looking up at Mrs. Weasley, whose hair was disheveled and whose face was contorted with rage. Whoa, okay. I'm so sorry to break up this cozy little gathering, she said, her voice trembling. I'm sure you all need your rest, but there are wedding presents stacked in my room that need sorting out, and I was under the impression that you had agreed to help. Oh. Yes, said Hermione, looking terrified as she leapt to her feet, sending books flying in every direction. We will... We're sorry... With an anguished look at Harry and Ron, Hermione hurried out of the room after Mrs. Weasley. It's like being a house elf, complained Ron in an undertone, still massaging his head as he, he and Harry followed. 
sit without the job satisfaction. The sooner this wedding's over, the happier I'll be. Yeah, said Harry. Then we'll have nothing to do except find Horcruxes. It'll be like a holiday, won't it? Ron started to laugh. But at the sight of the enormous pile of wedding presents waiting for them in Mrs. Weasley's room, stopped quite abruptly. The Delacour has arrived the following morning at 11 o'clock. Harry, Ron, Hermione, and Ginny were feeling quite resentful towards Fleur's family. But can you give me some adjectives for the, the Delacour parents, please? <laughs> it's going to be a whole bunch of French accents. <laughs> Uh, Kenton! Kenton's on the stream! Um... Okay. Harry, Ron, Her Hermione, and Ginny were feeling quite resentful towards Fleur's family by this time, and it was with an ill grace that Ron stumped back upstairs to put on matching socks, and Harry attempted to flatten his hair. Once they had all been deemed smart enough, they trooped out into the sunny backyard to await the visitors. They'll get descriptions in the book. French, haughty, okay. As French as you can. Oh my gosh. Harry had never seen the place looking so tidy. The rusty cauldrons and old Wellington books that usually littered the steps by the back door were gone, replaced by two new Flutterby bushes standing either side of the door in large pots. Though there was no breeze, the leaves waved lazily, giving an attractive rippling effect. The chickens had been shut away, the yard had been swept, and the nearby garden had been pruned, plucked, and generally spruced up, although Harry, who liked it in its overgrown state, thought that it looked rather forlorn with its usual con without its usual contingent of caper capering gnomes. Hey, buddy. Come here. Come here. Come, bud. You just going to look at me again? Come here. Just staring at me. Ultra John French, uh, Ultra French John incoming. He had lost track of how many security enchantments had been placed upon the burrow by both the Order and the Ministry. All he knew was that it was no longer possible for anybody to travel by magic directly into the place. Mr. Weasley had therefore gone to meet the Delacours on top of a nearby hill, where they were to arrive by portkey. The first sound of their approach was an, un an unusually high-pitched laugh, which turned out to be coming from Mr. Weasley who appeared at the gate moments later, laden with luggage and leading a beautiful blonde woman in long leaf green robes who could only be Fleur's mother. What if somebody disguises themselves as one of the de Fleurs? What if? Oh, there he is. There he is. Mama! cried Fleur, rushing forward to embrace her. Papa! Monsieur de la Cure was nowhere near as attractive as his wife. He was a head shorter and extremely plump, with a little pointed black beard. <laughs> However, he looked good-natured. Bouncing towards Mrs. Weasley on a high-heeled boots, he kissed her twice on each cheek, lav leaving her flustered. Deep voice. You have been too much trouble, he said in a deep voice. Fleur tells us you have been working very hard. Oh, it's nothing, nothing, trilled Mrs. Weasley. No trouble at all. <laughs> Ron relieved his feelings by aiming a kick at a gnome who was peering out from behind one of the new Flutterby bushes. Uh, uh, Monsieur de la Cour. Dear lady, said Monsieur de la Cour, still holding Mrs. Weasley's hand between his own two plump ones and beaming. We are most honored at the approaching union of our two families. Let me present my wife, Apo Apolline. Apolline. Madame de la Cour glided forwards and stooped to kiss uh, Mrs. Weasley, too. Oh, Chantal. <laughs> Listen, it's her voice. She said, Your husband has been telling us. Your husband has, your husband has been telling us such amusing story. <laughs> Mr. Weasley gave a maniacal laugh. <laughs> Mrs. Weasley threw him a look, upon which he became immediately silent and assumed an expression appropriate to the sick bed of a close friend. <laughs> a 
And of course, you have met my little daughter, Gabrielle, said Madame de la Cour. Gabrielle was Fleur in miniature. Eleven years old, with waist-length hair of pure silvery blonde, she gave Mrs. Weasley a dazzling smile and hugged her, then threw Harry a glowing look, batting her eyelashes. Ginny cleared her throat loudly. Well, come in, do, said Mrs. Weasley brightly, and she ushered the Delacours into the house with many no pleases and after yous and oh, and not, not at alls. The Delacours, it soon transpired, were helpful, pleasant guests. They were pleased with everything, and keen to assist with the preparations for the wedding. Monsieur Delacour um, pronounced everything from the seating plan to the bridesmaid's shoes. Charmant! Charmant? Charmant! Charmant! I think. Madame Delacour was most accomplished at household spells, and had the oven properly cleansed in a trice. Gabrielle followed her elder sister around, trying to assist in ways she could, she could, and jabbering away in rapid French. I had French for two or three years in uh, in high school, and uh, uh, I I don't remember a lot. I'm like je m'appelle John Vath, j'habite à la Canada, and the sentence, one of the only sentences I remember is il est bon la raisin, which is the raisin is good. I can, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to survive. The mother sounds so much like a Canadian guy trying to do a French accent. <laughs> well, that's what's happening. <laughs> uh, my stream had a dodgy moment. What about everybody else? Yeah, I, I saw that on my stream too. My stream is now very low quality still. I'm sorry. I, I hope it's all... It's. I hope it's not from my computer, but maybe it is. Who knows? Oh, this charming, uh, this uh, streaming stuff. On the downside, the borough was not built to accommodate so many people. Mr. and Mrs. Weasley were now sleeping in the sitting room, having shouted down Monsieur and Madame de la Cour's protests and insisted they take their bedroom. Gabrielle was sleeping with Fleur in Percy's old room. Percy. And Bill would be sharing with Charlie, his best man, once Charlie arrived from Romania. Opportunities to make plans together became virtually non-existent, and it was in desperation that Harry, Ron, and Hermione took to volunteering to feed the chickens just to escape the overcrowded house. But he still won't leave us alone, snarled Ron, as their second attempt at a meeting in the yard was foiled by the appearance of Mrs. Weasley carrying a large basket of laundry in her arms. Um, oh, good. He fed the chickens, she called as she approached them. We better shut them away again before the men arrive tomorrow to put, the te to put up the tent for the wedding, she explained, pausing to lean against the, the hen house. She looked exhausted. Millamont's magic marquees. They're very good. Uh, Bill's escorting them. Oh, you better stay inside while, you, while they're here, Harry. I must say, it does complicate organizing a wedding, having all these security spells around the place. I'm sorry, said Harry humbly. Oh, don't be silly, dear, said Mrs. Weasley at once. I didn't mean... Well, your safety is much more important. Actually, I've been wanting to ask you how you, how you want to celebrate your birthday, Harry. Seventeen, after all. It's an important day. I don't want a fuss, said Harry quickly, envisaging the additional strain this would put on them all. Really, Mr. We Mrs. Weasley, just a normal dinner would be fine. It's the day before the wedding. Oh, well, if you're sure, dear. I'll invite Remus and Tonk, shall I? And how about Hagrid? That'd be great, said Harry, but please don't go to loads of trouble. Not at all, not at all. It's no trouble. <laughs> she looked at him, a long, searching look, then smiled a little, little sadly, straightening up and walking away. Harry watched as she waved her wand near the washing line, and the damp clothes rose into the air to hang themselves up, and suddenly he felt a great wave of remorse for the inconvenience and the pain he was giving her. End of chapter. Next one's called Chapter 7, The Will of Albus Dumbledore. Can't wait to read that one. I cannot wait. Oh, wow. Okay, so... I have a little bit of a a, 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 a thought, a premonition, because he said, remorse, remorse will destroy the Horcruxes. 
right? So I've, I do have a question, and if, if if the answer doesn't spoil anything, but if it's going to be talked about later, you know, is since he's created six Horcruxes, is his body, his actual body, the seventh Horcrux? So, you know, so is, is that a Horcrux as well? So in any case, I think that when it comes down to the showdown between Harry and Voldemort, because Dumbledore was trying to train Harry to not get angry, to manage his feelings, uh, to manage those outbursts because they're linked to, to, to Voldemort. I think because they're so linked in some way that it's almost like a sliding scale, that, that, that Harry's so good, such a good person, and Voldemort's so evil that, you know, they're constantly pulling their personalities uh, in different directions. So Harry has got an angry streak. And uh, and so I think that maybe in the final battle that Harry was going to find a way because of that emotional connection between them. He's going to find a way to feel all the pain and all the remorse and all the suffering that 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 Voldemort has caused that Harry's going to going to try and feel it all to destroy Voldemort's horcruxes that's my premonition that's what I think don't confirm it or deny it I just I'm putting it out there uh remorse puts the soul back together I haven't been in almost two years Dumbledore told Harry the seventh soul is in Voldemort's body yes okay so that's my that's that's what I, th I think will happen. We'll see, we'll see. Uh, where's Dexy? Dex is back there. You see him now? Back there, he's staring at me again. Uh, how was the stream today? I, 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 it, 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 was it low quality or normal quality? I'd like to know. It, it, is that close? Num November eighteenth, the final battle because of the connection. Harry will find a way to feel all the pain and suffering Voldemort has caused to destroy the Horcruxes. Yeah, he will either. Um, find a way to feel all the pain but he will try and make Voldemort feel all of that through Harry in some way yeah okay everybody we, we will be back to reading tomorrow again 6pm PST a couple of things I'm going to mention at the end uh, please like the video uh, the one that I upload please that, that, that helps with the algorithm and everything else if you're interested in Twitch and uh, I'm going to be streaming um, not this book I'll be streaming video games there. Maybe when I start reading the next book, I'll also also be streaming to YouTube and that for the next book that I'm reading. Um, and if you if you'd like to support me, head to my Patreon. It's in the in the link in the bio uh, because I would love to do this forever. <laughs> right now, my my job's good. It's it's bouncing up, but I don't know where where work's going to go after this all lifts. But if I could do this for just read to people for a long time, well, that would be awesome. Anyway, if you'd like to. All right, everybody. Much love. Please, uh, for those of you who have had a, a tough day, I hope this helped out. Uh, reach out to somebody. Say that you're feeling shitty. <laughs> stream, whatever. Uh, say that you're feeling shitty, that you're feeling crappy, uh, and that you'd like to talk to somebody, if that's the case. Because, uh, yeah. Depression and self-harm statistics have gone off the charts. So if you find yourself in that position, please reach out to anybody and just tell them how crappy you're feeling, even though that if that is the most difficult thing to do. Please do reach out. All right. Much love to you. I will see you tomorrow.